Just to re reiterate what Anthony said, well said, emphasize it. Pray for this, pray for this, always pray for this. We got legislation coming up in our state that, uh, yeah, we can criticize Maryland, but what about us, right? And um, today as an action, we're going to pray. We're going to pray after service, so uh, join us. The um, TAC on Children is definitely, definitely an eye-opener to a lot of people. Uh, we've showed you guys some of the stuff on our Prophecy Update on, on Wednesday, um, even Disney um, that a lot of people think it's pretty sanitized, has taken a, uh, a blatant role against, uh, against kids and the sexualization and homosexualization of our kids. And uh, from kindergarten all the way to third grade, they're opposing any law that comes against it. I mean, the left has had this thing, and I don't mean to make a joke out of it, but I've read the law in Florida. Uh, actually, doesn't, I don't think it goes far enough because teachers can still talk to their uh, students one-on-one -on -one about sexualization, the, uh, you know, their own view on certain things. One-on-one. -on -one. They can't do it openly, which is odd to me because that's what the law says. But the, the left is very upset about that law, and Disney's very upset about that law. So if you don't know what, what I'm talking about, it's too long. Watch the prophecy update, but that's what we're talking about. It's Bill 1557 in Florida, sexualization of kids at kindergarten to third grade level. And uh, so I don't believe the law goes far enough, but then again, the left is gets really upset about it because they have a problem. The problem is they want to talk to kids about this. They have a desire to really talk to kids about their own sexuality, uh, which is bizarre because I would be opposed even to a heterosexual couple talking to kids about what they do. Uh, but nonetheless, this is where we are. It's not a political statement, it's a reality statement. And, um, and of course, these laws come against the very thing. We don't know what life is. We don't know uh, the gender of people anymore. We don't know society has lost its compass. We don't know anything about anything anymore. It seems like we're very happy about not knowing, which causes a lot of things to come into our society. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about something that it's prevalent in the church and maybe if I worded it correctly, it may be the reason why society is the way it is, because of what's happening in the church. Remember, the church is salt and light to the earth. Right? So the church is salt and light. Believers are salt and light. When the church or when believers are no longer salt and light, Jesus said, it's good for nothing. Yeah, we're no longer salt and light. It is only good to be trampled under the feet of men. Uh, meaning what Jesus said, now remember, this is what Jesus said, not what Marco says. What Jesus says is that when Christians is no longer salt and light on, the, uh, on their earth, and their society, uh, they, they really are worth nothing because society won't listen to them. And they'll just trample over whatever they said because it really means nothing to them. And that's because the church has vac vacated its role in society, which is to be salt and light. And what salt does, it preserves. It preserves society. Uh, the Bible is like salt. It preserves you, it preserves your marriage, it preserves the church, it preserves society. But when the church has lost the word or the understanding of the word, then it becomes like nothing. It just, nothing, no one pays attention to it anymore. It's just religion. It's just something that you normally come and do on Sundays and you go home and you live your normal life, right? And, and, and unfortunately, this is not a, uh, I got to get on with the study. Uh, but unfortunately, that's the way many, many people look at it. This is, this is you come to church, and you kind of escape reality in a sense. And you sort of do your spiritual thing. And once your spiritual thing is over, then you go back to the real world. And so you don't have to remember anything that we did here, because this is sort of just a, uh, uh, a traditional thing that you do. This is just what you do. It's, um, and it becomes really hard to take that into real life, society. Now, the Bible is different. The Bible says, you know, this is reality. The world is not reality. They don't live in the reality of God or truth, and therefore they don't know anything that's happening in the world or the outcome. They may know a lot of things, professing to be wise, but they don't know where they came from, where this, why is this is happening, or where this is going. The Christian, on the other hand, has the incredible advantage of knowing Christ, knowing the wisdom of God, knowing the Word of God, and therefore can know why things are happening and where this is going. And we have that incredible advantage, don't we? Uh, if you're a believer, if you're a true born-again believer, I'm, I'm referring to those who are faithful to Christ, not just church attendees, which we have a lot in our nation. 
Uh, but that's the reality of where we live. That's the reality of where we are. What are we going to do about it? It's we needing to get into God's word because unless you know, you won't grow. Unless you know, you won't grow. And you won't grow unless you know the scriptures. The scriptures. So all those things that we always thought were boring and it's like, oh, why pray? Why read the Bible? You know, why come to, ch why come to church and fellowship? Those things are essential, vital, foundational for you and your family. And if you want to preserve your marriage, get into God's word. If you want to preserve your faith, get into God's word. If you want to preserve your church, get into God's word. We're doing that here. If you want to preserve society, get into God's word and take it into the world in which you live. Sunday nights, Mondays, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? Take it into that arena and you'll see a preservation of society. And if all Christians did that, I, I would tell you without a doubt, society would not look the way it looks. It would not look the way it looks. There will always be a fringe, but overall society would not be on the road to destruction that we see it today. And nobody knows where, the, by the way, there's no off ramps. You talk to any sociologist, any commentator, they don't know the off ramps. What do you mean off ramps? Meaning they don't know what's going to stop the avalanche of where we're going. Nobody really knows. A lot of them believe it's political. You know, if you just pass enough laws, you'll be able to stop politically the avalanche of evil. If you just pass enough things, enough congressmen get on, enough things. And they might for a time preserve, or for a little bit preserve it, but they won't last. Because all it takes is for another election or another law to come into place and replace it. And there you have the proverbial, you know, nothing really makes sense <laughs> if you just keep passing laws and there's just enough laws to overcome that law. Uh, there'll just be an unending law passing and nobody will really know what we need to do. Uh, all that to say, we need to pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for the cross and the blood of your son. We ask you, Lord, that through his death and resurrection, we may obtain, Lord, our own resurrection, that we will have eternal life. And you, in your grace and by your spirit, you would teach us these things so that we will take it seriously, Lord. Maybe for once in our lives, we will take it seriously and apply it, not just what we know, but what it means to know these truths. For we ask in faith, believing in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we're a little bit behind already. Enough of my diatribe, but it was important to kind of Set the table for this. Because the book of Hebrews is written to believers, Jewish believers at the time of the first century who lived around Jerusalem. And they were thinking that even though they known about the facts of the death and resurrection of Jesus, they knew all this. The writer of Hebrews is warning them because the believers around Jerusalem around this time, first century, around 55 to 60 AD, just before the destruction of the temple, it was still standing there that they could see outside and they could see the temple still standing. They could see the sacrifice. They could see the priest. And they could see where they came from, where they used to be. They used to be part of the old covenant relationship with God. But now they had received the gospel and they were being tempted to go back under the law and they were being tempted to go back to where they used to be, who they used to be, where they used to be. And so it's a warning. And so the book of Hebrews is a wonderful exhortation, but it's also an awesome warning, a great warning to anybody, any one of us who is tempted to go back to who, who you used to be. Remember who you used to be before Christ. The temptation is always going to be there to go back and forsake what you know in the gospel. And he warned them that to turn from Christ is to turn from the glory of God, which is in the face of Jesus. And the only alternative, if you leave Christ, is outer darkness. That's the only alternative you have. There is no other alternative. And by the grace of God, we get to the end of it. I'll show you in practical terms what that means even to people that say things on the airwaves. Only two ways to be a Christian. Only two ways, sorry, two ways as a Christian can go. Only two ways a Christian can go. He can go forward with Jesus or he can go back and begin to drift away. There's only two, okay? And uh, I know people try to make three and four and five and, and they, they hopefully there was a three and hopefully there was a four but as a Christian, there's only two ways you can go. You can either go forward in Jesus or you would go back. And if you say, well, what about neutral? Neutral means you're not going forward. That means going back. So that's, that's two. There's still only two, right? And uh, he's reminding the believers here in this chapter, especially chapter 5 and chapter 6, 
that there is a way to know that you're growing as a Christian, and that is maturity. How to secure, how to secure your progress as a Christian. Uh, and I'm going to fast forward this. How to secure your progress as a Christian is to, one, expose yourself to the Word of God. Expose yourself to the Word of God. Your heart, your mind, right? And i got to ask you this question. Have you done that since last Sunday? Have you done that since last Sunday? Did you expose yourself to the Word of God in heart and mind from Monday to Saturday? Because you're back here again. Hopefully you're back here again from last Sunday. Uh, but have you done that? In all honesty and sincerity, nobody will know except you and the Lord, but you can answer that. Uh, the second way to keep your faith growing, to keep your faith in Christ, is to keep your eyes on this great high priest, Jesus, our great high priest. I'm kind of jumping around a little bit because they're not in order for some reason. To keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, your high priest, in whom you know that you can come to him for mercy for when you've blown it, and grace that you need to go forward in time of need. So the mercy for what you've done that's wrong. Come to Christ for every time you fail and fall, and you come to him for mercy. Don't you need mercy today? I'm telling you, if it wasn't for mercy, you wouldn't be here. And if it wasn't for mercy, you wouldn't have anybody here in the pulpit. So mercy, we receive mercy. And how about grace? Well, after you have stood up with Christ, you need grace to go on, don't you? You need grace to go on, and therefore you need a mediator. And that mediator is the one that you can fix your eyes. Later on, the book of Hebrews will give us more of that, right? Fix your eyes on Jesus. And that's how I make progress in my Christian life. But he also told us that you can also measure yourself if you see if you're making progress. How do you know that? If you have an understanding of God's word, that is maturity. Are you growing in that understanding? Do you have today a greater understanding of God's word than you did last year or the year before or two years ago or three years ago, right? In what ways are you growing in God's word and understanding, right? You won't grow unless you know and you don't know unless, you know, unless you know you won't grow, right? That's the uh, sort of a jingle, but that's, that's truth, right? You won't know, right? Uh, you won't grow unless you know, and unless you know, you won't grow. Know what? The Word of God and what it means. And I'm going to explain what doesn't mean because I assume anybody would think, well, he just wants me to be a theologian. No, I don't want you to be a theologian. I know plenty of theologians and they're not saved. Plenty of theologians and they're not saved. Drive down the street, 210 freeway, get off on, uh, what would that be, uh, Claremont Theological Cemetery? Seminary? No, cemetery? One of the two, right? Uh, which one is that exit? Uh, whatever it is, right? Uh, Monte Vista or something. Uh, baseline. And just drive down there, and you'll find plenty of people that will tell you about the Bible. But they don't know what the Bible is about. They don't know what the Bible is about. Plenty of people will tell you a lot about the Bible. But what, does, what is the Bible about is what they don't know. So I don't want you to be a theologian. I don't want you to be necessarily lost. They are theologians that are saved. That's not the point. It's to understand the implications of what you read. What does it mean when I read to love my enemies? What does it mean to live a holy life? What does that mean to me? How does that apply to me? I know the, the general aspects of it. Yeah, I think Christians should live a holy life, but what does that mean to me? And what am I doing about it? Am I living a holy life, right? So from milk, I've got to get there, from milk to meat, the growing in the Christian life, to know Christ and go on with Christ into maturity. And he says, we will do so if God permits. And so the preacher's stirring up the, 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 the people of the, in, the, in the book of Hebrews. He's stirring up his audience, right? He's stirring them up so that they can grow and they go from babies, right, who desire the milk. That's a good thing to have. Our babies are good. I love babies. I had five of them, so love my, all my babies. But now I want them to grow and grow in right living. And I want them to grow in righteousness, so that they can actually be able to stand and grow in Christ on their own. So they need other types of food, right? That's the book of Hebrews, basically. And the only thing, and, and, and take a look at this. When I come up here, and the only thing I'm thinking about is, you know, I, I have to discipline myself because sometimes we come up here and, you know, I could, you know, motivate people in certain ways, but that's my only emphasis today here is to really think about two things, is to edify and preach the word. 
edify and preach the word. So only two things I'm thinking about. Sometimes when I come up here and people, you know, sometimes they think I'm rude. I'm not being rude. I'm thinking a lot of times, but, you know, and I, I try to be friendly and try to be sad to everybody, of course. Uh, but, you know, sometimes that happens. You're tunnel vision sometimes. And the only thing I'm thinking about is, like, how can I preach and how can I edify? And how can I let you have something that you can grab a hold of it in your teeth and say, I can get a hold of this and take it home Monday through Saturday. I could apply these things to my life. And that is to expand your thinking. Expand your thinking of the divine word. How can I get you to expand your thinking about the divine word and apply it to your life, right? For work, for your life, for marriage, for neighborhood, for witnessing, right? As you understand more, as you grow more, you will know more, and you'll be able to discern. Did I have that down? Discern good and evil. There it is, yeah. You'll be able to discern good and evil. You know, there's a lot of Christians that don't know. They're like, is abortion bad? I'm honestly saying this. I mean, there's Christians who tell me, Pastor, I don't know. I mean, really? And I said, how do you know what good and evil is? It, it is evil. It is evil. Can you discern it? Can you discern euthanasia, whether it's good or bad? Can you just discern some of the social issues in life? How can a Christian discern the word of God? You will learn to discern good and evil if you Know the word of God. You won't have anybody to teach, teach you a five-hour seminar on why is it bad. You would go like, yeah, we already know it's bad. Why? The word says it. I know what this means, and I know what that means, and how to apply wisdom to that. And you're not just becoming smart. You're becoming wise. Wise unto salvation, which is the whole of Scripture, isn't it? It's to make you, you know, the Scriptures are not to make you rich, not to make you clever, they're not to make you famous, definitely not famous, the word is not to make you popular, definitely not that in these days. It's to make you wise unto salvation. Are you wise? And the other thing it's going to do, it's going to help you teach others. Isn't that wonderful? You're going to be able to teach others. You're not going to be the one that needs to be taught, but you're the one that's going to be teaching. Oh, I have no desire for teaching. Well, that's what, I, that's what I thought, right? But God begins to change you. This is not a commercial, again, for a children's ministry or anything like that. This is, you know, I'm not, you know, Nora didn't tell me to say this, you know. But it's, it's, it's true. You walk up to Nora today and just say, you know what? Pastor said I need to be a teacher. I ought to be a teacher by now. I've been taught for a long time here. I need to be a teacher. Can you use me? She'll sign you up. Honestly, we always need teachers. And sign you up. Why? Because... There's a need for children, for teachers to, or Christians to become teachers. Not just to be taught, but to become teachers. You ever thought about it? Have you ever thought of stepping out and saying, well, you know, I've been a Christian for 10 years or so, and I've been taught some wonderful things by wonderful pastors throughout my life. I think it's time for me to teach somebody about this. And you step out, by the way, you're looking at somebody that spent time in there. Uh, I just didn't start in the congregational teaching. I spent time in children's ministry, youth ministry, college ministry, youth, uh, uh, young believers ministry. Why? That's where you grow, and that's where you begin to teach, and that's where you begin to explain things that you yourself are growing in, and you'll be able to teach these things, right? Uh, but do take me seriously. If you want to step out in faith, teach. And by the way, here's the great secret about teachers. Every teacher here knows you learn more when you teach. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, Absolutely. Things that you have, I was like, I didn't know that. That's because you never taught it to anybody. And you'll begin to grow yourself into a more mature believer. Don't you want to be a mature believer? Absolutely. I do. I do want to. So did, uh, did I have that? Where is it? Uh, no, no, no. There it is. Did you make your list? What list? I asked you last time, if we started, as, as we finish, right? Do you, can you make a list of what possible ways you can increase your understanding of God's word? What ways can you understand God's word be more and better, right? Did you make that list, right? I did. I made a list, and I said, well, I just need to spend more praying about the word, right? Praying in God's word, meaning that I need to spend more time after I read and understand the text. I need to pray more about what I just read and understood because my understanding can be faulty. Yeah, I, I, I'm not infallible. I'm not the Pope, right? I, I can't. I don't know some of these things, so I need to know the truth. I need to know exactly what I'm talking about. And in God's Word, we have a definite understanding of God's Word, and therefore, I am not to lean on my own understanding, 
but to lean on God's word and understanding his word through his spirit as he reveals it to us, right? So we got to build on this, all right? What are the fundamentals? I left you with that, right? Chapters five, chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, all that to say, not too bad. Uh, all that to say, there's elementary principles. Verse 1, therefore, we have to leave the elementary print teachings or principles about the Messiah, about Christ, chapter 6, verse 1. Let us press on to maturity. All right, so I, I explained last time. Leaving doesn't mean you forget about them, right? Leaving means once you've learned them, you build on them, right? Just like this, right? Talk about the ABCs, talk about arithmetic, right? Your timetables, remember the whole horrible experience I had learning the timetables? No, did I tell you that? Okay, good, don't need to tell you. All right, uh, but you learned them, and to this day, I know them. I know them, and the reality was it was just you know, drilled into me, and therefore now I could do arithmetic, I could do a little algebra, right? Um, the sad part is you forget about it after a while, right? I used to know how to do uh, trigonometry and calculus and things like that, but I forget now, right? So then here's the, the most important part. You make a list. You make a list of the things that you want to grow on, and you build on them, right? So now that you made that list, hopefully, these are a list here that the book of Hebrews tells us on the fundamental things, just fundamental things. Uh, three pairs... Yeah, here it is. Six doctrines and three pairs. That according to this, according to this, this is elementary. This is this. Is this. You know, th th again, this is not a knock on anybody. This is just the reality of where we are, right? Six doctrines, six doctrines that are basically um, basic elementary principles. Six doctrines, three pairs. Uh, where are they at? Right here. Repentance. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God, instructions about washings, laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. What are these things, right? By the way, I told you last week, there's so much controversy about this, but these are just principles. I don't know why the controversy is, but maybe we'll take a look at it, right? Uh, you take a young believer and you teach them these things, and they are supposed to know them. And so we're supposed to know them, right? Uh, some people don't even know what these are. And so, unfortunately, that's a very severely malnourished Christian, a very severely mal malnourished Christian. But let's take the first two. Let's take the first set of two, the, 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 the first two. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Are you clear about where the Christian life begins? How does the Christian life begin, right? Uh, people say, you know, ask Jesus into your heart. Although I may not object somebody using those terms, they're not very biblical, right? And so I'm not, I, don't, I won't object to them, but they're not very biblical. Where does faith begins or the Christian life begins? It begins with repentance. It begins with repentance. Christians ought to know that the Christian gospel and the Christian life always begins from turning from sin. Always begins turning from sin. It begins with repentance to, from dead works toward God. That's always repentance. From something to something, right? If you repent of something, it's from it toward God. That's the biblical definition of repentance, right? And from dead works, and then it becomes faith. You have faith toward what God has done. And if a person sees what God has done through Christ, right, they hate their sin, and they turn from sin toward God, they will have faith in Jesus Christ, what God has done for them, and the promises of Christ, and therefore the Christian life can begin. Isn't that wonderful? That's how the Christian life begins, right? I'll take the last two. The resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. I'm not trying to avoid the middle two, but there's more controversy about the middle two. But if you get the, if you get the bookends, it's easier to get the, the middle. If you get the bread at the sandwich, it comes easy. The last two, eternal life or uh, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Are you, are you clear where the Christian life heads to? So now you become a Christian through repentance and faith. Are you clear where this is going to go to? Right? We're moving in a direction. What is a direction? Etern the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, right? Where are we going? To those two things. There's an end to our journey, and the great hope is to be with Christ. What is going to be that day? It's going to be the resurrection. It's going to be the rapture of resurrection, and if you're still in the grave, it will be resurrection. Those who are alive and remain will be cut up to meet the Lord in the air. We'll be snatched up and changed, reunited. That's an awesome thing. But then there's judgment, and the judgment is all men are going to be judged, all men are going to be judged. All humanity will be judged for what they have done, what they were not, and what they broke against God's word. But if they have the pardon, if they have the forgiveness of Christ, 
then there's no fear in that judgment day. There'll be no fear in that judgment day because God will see in your life Christ. God will see Christ in your life. And therefore, even though we deserve death, Christ died our death. And even though we deserve judgment, Christ paid in his judgment on the cross. And we are acquitted. And we are acquitted. And therefore, eternal life leads to everlasting life and ending life. And therefore, the Christian feels confident on that day. There'll be no condemnation for the believer. And it leads there, right? The confidence that began in repentance and faith will one day lead to the resurrection in confidence in judgment, the eternal judgment. Those without Christ will suffer an eternal judgment without acquittal, without forgiveness, without any form of escape. They have no Christ. They have no uh, acquittal. They have no pardon. They have no forgiveness, right? The time to get forgiveness is now. This is the time to do it is now. Don't wait until that day. Now, what about the middle two? I didn't uh, delay it, but there was controversy in all of church history, by the way. And uh, we're going to settle it here, right? We're going to settle it here. I might complicate things more, but I'll tell you what it says, right? Great controversy, the middle two. Some commentators, and I think they're right, and there's, there's truth to this. Some commentators believe that the part where it says repentance of dead works and faith and instructions about washings and laying on of hands, which is the middle two, the instructions about baptisms to be translated washings, but okay, we'll take baptisms. It's the word washings in, in, in the Greek. Uh, leads to us to believe that they're like, there's a bracket in here, meaning that repentance and faith that the first brought up are prefigured in the Jewish Old Testament, in the Old Testament, by the washings and the laying on of hands, meaning that the washings that the people had to do, remember, baptisms, like the, you see in the New Testament, were originally in the Old Testament. They're not a new thing. What it was new was the baptism into Christ, into the body of Christ. What it was in the Old Testament, it was a symbol that there was a cleansing that needed to happen in your life. And so the, the Jews constantly had this ritual of washings and cleansings, right? Before, even the priests had to wash themselves constantly before even serving the temple. And this cleansing was prefigured. This washing was prefiguring what the Jews did in the Old Testament. And the laying on of hands was, of course, when the priests would lay hands on the sacrifice... It was a prefigure of the ultimate sacrifice that was going to come, and Jesus would be that one. And in, in the Old Testament, they had faith that if they confessed their sins over that animal, over that sacrifice, that God would not account their sins, and God would forgive them. God would cover them because of that sacrifice, and therefore it was accounted to them as forgiveness temporarily because they had to do it every year. And now, though, because we have faith in Jesus Christ, because of the gospel, we have salvation, and that prefigure in the Old Testament is now clear in the New Testament that the sacrifice was Christ, and if we lay our hands on him, then we have forgiveness of sins forever. We have an account of forgiveness of sin because Jesus now rose from the dead, and he forever lives now to make intercession for us. So the washings in the, in the Old Testament and the laying on of hands in the Old Testament were prefigures of the gospel that we love so much, right? And, and that's, I think that's pretty, pretty right on. I think that's pretty true. Now, I would like to apply it in, in, in this way. If we go back to the principles here, here we go, right? The first two, they deal with our relationship with God, doesn't it? A relationship with God, repentance toward God and faith in Christ, right? We have relationship with God. The middle two are ordinances in the church. And the last two, it's about the future. So what you're really looking at is how we became saved in our relationship toward God how we're to relate to others in the body, and what's going to happen to us in the future. What's your relationship to the future? And I think this is pretty spot on because it's exactly what the book of Hebrews is relating us to. Salvation, relationship, and the future. That's what a Christian is always supposed to have. How did you get started in Christ? What's your relationship with other believers? And where are you going? And this is exactly what these three sets or you know, six doctrines, three pairs, right? And you have this washings, this, this baptism, as it were. And these washings, of course, for the Christian has to do with the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who washes us, who puts us into Christ, 1 Corinthians 12. But that's all, that's an inward. It happens inward when you come to Christ. But the outward is expressed at believer's baptism. When you go into the water, right? When you go into the washing, as it were. But Peter says, you're not washing your filth of the flesh. You're clearing your conscience because that clearing has already happened within 
the context of the Holy Spirit coming into you, 1 Corinthians 12, washing you, and now you demonstrate that repentance and washings that have happened internally, you have demonstrated through the outside, through the baptism on the outward, through the baptism of water, a clear conscience toward God. Whatever ask, God has asked you to do, you have complied. You have done well up to that point. And so when we live in this Christian relationship, right? That's the, that's the washings, that's the baptism. What about the laying out of hands? The apostles are overworked. The apostles in Jerusalem cannot keep up with everything. They choose for themselves six men that can come and help with the church, right? In the book of Acts chapter 6, they choose seven men, sorry. And the apostles can go on with their ministry. And their administrative task is laid upon the deacons. That's where the deacons come from, right? Where the apostles laid hands on the deacons and says, you now are going to take care of the church we will maintain the spiritual aspect of the church by praying and teaching and being in God's word. And so they could go on with their ministry, but the church was taken care of by the handling of the deacons. How did they do this? They laid hands on them. Paul and Barnabas are at a church. They're praying and fasting. And the Holy Spirit says, set out to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work of the ministry. That's Paul. And they laid hands on them and they send them out because they were called to now appoint uh, they were called out to go and minister the gospel to people. And when they went to every city, every church, every place that they set up a church, Paul and Barnabas laid hands on the elders. So when they left, the church was left with godly leadership, good leadership, godly people that can help oversee the direction of the church, and they laid hands on them. So what does that tell you about laying on our hands? It's simply the recognition of God's ministry in a person's life. No person can put anybody into a ministry. The Lord does. No person. I want to make that clear. No person has the authority to say, you are in the ministry, you are in the ministry. In the ministry. It's a recognition. It's simply saying, I recognize God's spirit upon this man, upon this lady, upon this man, and I am going to, by the leading of the spirit, have this man or this woman lead or serve in a capacity in which God has called them to be. He's gifted them. He's given them everything they need for service and lay hands on them, and they recognize that there's a proper leadership, whether it's eldership or deaconess, right? And now we can have proper leadership and safety in the church because Christians can grow now with godliness and sincerity because there's oversight and there's the framework of the Christian life. Repentance and faith, ordinances in the church, resurrection and eternal life. That's what you're seeing. And so if any Christian today can grasp those six things, you have graduated to milk. <laughs> that great? I just encourage everybody, right, by your smile. Right? You just did it. We just did it. Your future, I'm sorry, your, your past, ugh, this is remote, your beginning of the Christian life, repentance and faith. You're going on with Christians by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, by the washings, by the laying on of hands, ministry, recognition of ministry and service. Well, that's what we need to do to one another. And then we are marching on to eternal life, right? With confidence, knowing on that day, God will see Christ in me and I will be entered into eternal glory with my Lord. All right? That's, and you can, you can relate to it, six of them, right? So congratulations. We should get the certificates out. Everybody here has got some milk, right? Now, what about the rest, though? Chapter 7 says, I am going to teach you about Melchizedek. You're not ready yet, but chapter 7 will get you into the meat. You ready for the meat? All right? But before the meat comes, a warning. And boy, am I going to get in trouble today. I'm going to get in trouble today because depending on which direction of ministry or church activity or denomination you came from, you are either going to say, he's absolutely nuts, or he maybe say he's absolutely crazy, or he's absolutely not right, or whatever it may be, but it certainly brings a lot of controversy, right? Chapter 6, verse uh, 3. I'm oh, sorry, verse 4. For in the case of those who have been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit... And have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then they fall away, it is impossible to renew them to repentance, since they again crucify for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. 
For ground that drinks the rain, which is often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, useful to those who, uh, who, who sake it and is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. I don't think I'm going to be able to finish it today because there's so much to say. Um, I promise you, though, when we get back to Hebrews, that we will talk in, in, in more how this doctrines and theology have affected the church. Uh, but today, I want to really focus on what the text says, because we can also spend a whole hour on theology. We can spend theology, uh, whether it's the Reformed Calvinistic side or the Armenian side and those in between. And we can say, well, this is what this church believes, and this is what this other church believes. And uh, it may be worth doing it. However, it will be worth more if we just study the text and be Bereans and discover what the text says, not what a church teaches. Because sometimes theology can get in the way by presupposition. We presuppose this happens to a person, and therefore your lenses, right? Your lenses can be cloudy depending on the theology that you were originally taught. And so our goal, because we all have them, at least I have some frames, right? Uh, is to get rid of this and see the word in fresh, see the word anew, see the word as it, as it is written, right? Now, we're not going to tell the writer of Hebrews what he means by this. He's going to tell us what he means by it, which is the ultimate Bible study. Did you know that that's the ultimate Bible study? It's to let the word of God tell you. Right? It's called exegesis, another fancy word. It simply means you're just extracting from the Bible what it says. You're not putting your own thoughts into it. You're not putting your own things into it. You're just letting it tell you what it means. And you are happy with it. Hopefully you are. And uh, by adding other things to it, right, it becomes a little bit more confusing. That doesn't mean that we don't debate it, we don't talk about it, we don't discuss theological ideas. It just means that we first have to understand what did the writer intend? What did the writer intend? So to say this, let's go to, again, let's go to this passage. But I want to remind you something. Uh, this is going to be, I believe, the key to understand this passage it is... The parable of Jesus, Matthew chapter 13, right? Before we get into anything in Hebrews chapter 6, we need to think about the parable of Jesus. It's the parable of Jesus, and it sounds very familiar. In Matthew 13, it sounds very familiar to what the writer of Hebrews says. He talks about growth. He talks about thorns and thistles. He talks about some things not, some things not yielding fruit. Some things do yield fruit. This is exactly what our Lord said. And again, this is the New Testament. And by the way, New Testament, uh, Jesus said regarding this parable, if you understand this parable, you'll understand all the other parables. So get a hold of this parable if you've never studied in Matthew 13, and you'll find that you'll understand every parable that Jesus said afterwards. Amazing. By the way, this is the key to the New Testament too, because if you understand what Jesus is saying, then you'll understand why the epistles were written this way. You know, all the epistles did is took the teaching of Jesus and just explained it to us in a much simpler way. That's all the epistles have done. It's a commentary on the Gospels. What Jesus said, taken into a Gentile context, because we're all Gentiles here, right? No Jews here, maybe? No? Okay. Uh, in the Jewish context, it would have been the Gospels. In a Gentile context, it would have been the epistles. What does it mean to people that never been in the Jewish setting, what Jesus said? The epistles explain it to you. Easy, very easy to understand. That's what's a good way for new believers is to learn the epistles. So we have the soils. We have four soils, right? Uh, the first two, right? The first two immediately comes to mind is the one is a very stony ground. The first one, stony ground, and what comes after the seed is sown? There's a sower who sows the seed, and it lands on stony ground. And who comes but the birds? The birds come and snatch the seed away. Now, the Bible tells us, Jesus personally tells us who the birds represent. The birds represent the devil. Satan comes in and takes away the seed. And so some people hear the word and has no effect on them. They hear the word and leave a church place or a spiritual setting or a Bible study, and they leave, and nothing's changed in their life. Immediately, Satan comes in and takes the seed because the condition of the soil was stony, was hard, right? The second one, though. The second one is this one here. It is the shallow ground. It's like so stony ground, but it's the other one is the, 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 the hard ground. The second one is the shallow ground. What happens to them? The seed lands on the, on the shallow ground. There's no depth, but the, 
the plant grows very, very fast, swoops up very, very quickly, but it has no root. It's a very shallow root. And that root is superficial, and then the sun comes up, it says, and it withers because there's no moisture to draw from because the root of that plant is very, very shallow. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said, it's somebody who receives the word with great joy and rejoicing, gladness and emotion, fills their hearts, right? But when they realize the cost of following Jesus, they begin to withdraw. When they realize how much it costs to follow Jesus and leave behind what you have and really commit your life to the Lord and really follow Christ, and there might be persecutions that come with that for following Jesus, people wither away just like the plant. It's a perfect example. I don't want to concentrate on the first two, but the last two. The last two are very interesting. And the last two is basically the thorny ground and the good soil. What do we have there? Well, it simply is that the third one, it's very fascinating. It has roots. The plant grows. It receives the word. It has roots. It grows. It looks promising. It's encouraging. There's no birds. There's no withering. It's growing. And at the same time, gradually, though, strange things happen along the way in that it becomes filled with other things. And those are thorns, weeds, thistles, right? And they begin to take that life and choke it away. What did Jesus say about it? It is the person who, having received the word and has grown, all of a sudden there are things bigger to them than Jesus Christ. There are things more important. There are things that take the place of their faith in Jesus Christ, and they desire other things, Jesus said. They they desire other things, and one of the things they desire is the deceitfulness of riches and wealth, in which will rob them of their spiritual life. And so they deliberately give up their Christian life, and allow other things to come into their soil, as it were, to their life, and something else becomes more important than Christ. That's the third one. And the fourth one, of course, and we know, is the ones that grow. It's the ones that grow, and it's the one that bears fruit, and some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold, right? That means that the fruit of the Spirit is evident in their life, and then more of the Spirit is evident in their life, more of the character of Christ is spread in their lives, and they change life, and they praise God, and they go on. They go on and become great saints of the Lord, right? And it's a great parable, and look at verse 7. I'm going to jump down to verse 7 very quickly because it sounds a lot like it. For the ground that drinks the rain, Hebrews 6, 7, which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation, useful to those who, who, uh, for whose sake it and tilled receives a blessing from God. Rain coming down, it's a wonderful thing, right? Because it's like the word of God. God said in Isaiah that the, the rain is God's word. And Isaiah also says the rain is the Holy Spirit. And that, that person comes and brings it, and it brings forth uh, herbs, right? It brings forth vegetation, right? And they're planted and the seeds receive good nourishment. What a wonderful thing. Verse 8. But this, another ground receives also the rain and what grows on it is thorns, thistles, worthless and close to being accursed, right? It's very close reference to the, to the parable of the soils. In fact, I think the book of Hebrews is talking about the parable of the soils. So here's a man who has experienced God. Look back to verse 4. Enlightened by God. Right? He has seen the truth of the gospel. Here's a man who has been enlightened by God, received the truth of the gospel. What else does he have? He has tasted of the heavenly gift. Oh, that's wonderful. He has tasted of the gift, the dorea of God, the salvation. He knows life. He knows the true life. He benefits from the gospel, no doubt. He has, what else does he have? He has partaken, uh, I lost my place, and has made partakers of the Holy Spirit. The word partaker there is receive the Holy Spirit. The word partaker is receive the Holy Spirit. And he has really experienced with God. He has known God. He has tasted the heavenly gift. Partakers, what else does he have? He has also tasted. He has tasted of the good word of God. Doesn't the psalmist say, taste and see that the Lord is good? Absolutely it does, right? He has tasted of the good word of God, and he is also, he knows how good God is. He can rely on him. He could relish in God, but he has tasted of the powers of the age to come. That is, the reality of eternal life, right? That invisible life 
He could see past the visible and into that there is an eternal, there's an invisible life, right? That's faith. And he has partaken and tasted them through the Holy Spirit. He is a real person. He's a real believer. And it's an accurate description of a believer. I have no doubt this is an accurate description of a believer. And by the way, I believe it is talking about a real believer because of the many words it uses. It is not reflecting on some hypothetical thing. I think it's since very clear that the words that are used here is of somebody who has tasted, who has received, who has partaken, who has known, who has been enlightened by God's word. And I could say every person who's a born-again believer has experienced that. I no doubt believe that. No doubt believe it. And so the parable of the sower makes it clear that that is a person who has received the seed. Here's another believer, and the same thing happens to him. Enlightened of the Holy Spirit, received the Holy Spirit, enlightened by God, tasted and see God's word, and he's a, it, 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 it's happened to him as well. But what we don't know, according to Hebrews in the third soil, is that something is going to happen to that person. And that person, over the long run, is going to experience something. He is going to experience, one way or another, these two examples Something is going to happen to them. One will bear fruit, and the other one will bear thorns and thistles. Out of the same place that they started, and look at God's fairness. Did God sow the seed in every one of these soils? Yes, he did. Did rain come down on every one of these soils? Yes, it did. Did God intend it, or the sower intend to have fruit come out of that soil? Yes, he did. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sown it. Nobody goes out and sows these, and I hope they don't come. I'll be a strange farmer. I'll be a strange, I don't know, but it's gardener. I mean, Tony knows more about gardening than I will ever know, and he's forgotten more things that I will ever find out about gardening, but I'm sure he does not intend for tomatoes or pepper. What are you growing, Tony? Corn now? Or, I don't know what you Okay. Uh, he does not intend, well, I'm just going to plant because I don't want them. No, he intends good things to come out of the soil. So he can feed his family and feed others and feed many people, right? That's the intention of the sower. God intends that seed to make good in you and you and me. God intends for that to happen. And he sends the rain and he sends the spirit and he gives you good taste of the Holy Spirit and partakers of the Holy Spirit and the things to come. You are absolutely blessed. But something happens along the way. They both grow and they both end up in two different places. It was not the intention of the sower it was always about the condition of the soil, wouldn't it? The only difference is the condition of the soil. The condition of the soil determined, dictated it, what will happen in the end. Because the sower intended it for good. But somebody intended it for bad, right? So these two men, the first one partook of it, experienced God, loves the Bible, loves eternal life, loves the power of God's word, and he exposes himself to it, right? Just like we talked about. And when he fails, where does he go? Remember the two things that a Christian is always to do? Expose himself to the word of God and run to who? A great high priest. So when he fails, he runs to the great high priest and he grabs a hold of him and through constant use of the word, he becomes skillful. He becomes skillful in this. Nobody can pass a fast one by him, right? Nobody can pull a fast one on him. He is skillful in righteousness from milk to meat. And he grows, right? And he becomes useful. And he's teaching. And he continues to look for Christ. And when he's weak, he gets mercy. And when he goes on, he receives grace at the throne of grace. And he grows in knowledge. And his character is transformed. Holiness has grown in him. He's closer to God. He's walking with God. There's little by little growing in that holiness, living. And the character is looking more and more like Christ. Despite the conditions at time and his failure, he goes to the high priest, our high priest. And he's like a field, it says in verse 7. And he's like a field that the rain comes down. We had rain here in Devore, right? Come over and ground is wet, right? I had rain last week, too. So it's been good. God's, it's like God's word. I thought of the same thing, right? It's like, oh, God's word coming down. And it rains, and what it comes up, if you go to your garden, it comes up good soil. Good things are going to come out. And God looks at that life. It says in verse 7, God looks at it, and to those who have for sake of it has tilled it, right? So who has spent time sowing? That is God. And God's going to receive what in return? Fruit. He's going to look at that life, and he sees that man, 
And what does he end verse end of verse 7? That man receives a what? A blessing from God. It's so wonderful, right? And by the way, take a peek at verse 9 real quick because the writer of Hebrews says to the congregation of the book of Hebrews, he says, but beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, the things that accompany salvation, things that go along with salvation, though we're speaking in this way. He's saying, you know what? I don't think you guys are, you may be mature and you guys might be babies, but I am convinced and I am concerning you. I expect better things. I expect you to grow, right? The believers are in this category. The believers are to grow in that, right? So he's not condemning them. He's simply telling them, I Convince of better things for you. I want better things for you because of your growth. Because even though you are a immature baby and you know those six things, there's hope. You can still grow. All right? Now, the second example, the second gentleman. I got to finish. Yes, I do. Same thing to the first man. Same thing to the first man. Um, he's received the word of God. It's fresh. It's supposed to grow. Second Peter, first chapter one says that he has escaped the pollution of this world, right? Every person, every one of us has escaped the pollution of this world through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a knowledge of God that keeps us from being polluted by this world. And he has experienced the same thing that the other man that produced fruit experienced. But besides him, right next to him, there are things that he allowed to grow in his life. They're not spontaneous, by the way. It means that there was something that began to grow bigger than his faith. He stopped exposing himself to the word of God. He stopped coming to the high priest. His interest waned after some time. And instead of growing, he stood still, which I told you, there's no three, it's two. You either grow or you go back. So standing still, you're not growing. And the things that were hard for him to grasp at the beginning, he still doesn't get it. And the cares of this world becomes bigger and bigger and bigger than Christ himself. There is an attraction to riches. There's an attraction to be well off. There's an attraction to be prosperous. And it's more attractive than the Son of God. This is how dangerous it is. There's a desire for other things. This is Matthew 13. There's a desire for promotion, maybe popularity, maybe sports, maybe a girlfriend. There's a desire for those kinds of things, relationship. And something else eventually will come out in that, in that life, in that spiritual life. It is a deliberate act to opt out. And that life begins to fall away. Now, the book of Hebrews says he first drifts away. Now he says he falls away. So the book of Hebrews is, if you take the whole letter in context as a whole, is leading you to a step of, if you're not careful, Hebrews, if you're not careful, believer, your deliberate act of not wanting to grow, your deliberate act of not caring about it, your deliberate act of allowing other things to become bigger than Jesus, to be bigger in your affection, your affection is not as as clear as it used to be. It's sort of Gray now. It used to be pretty, pretty much affection of Christ was clear. Now it becomes doubtful where your affections are. And other things begin to take that place and slowly and slowly begin to choke, Jesus said, that plant that grew. And you begin to, verse 6, it is impossible to renew them to repentance since they again crucify themselves, the Son of God, and put him to open shame. What does that mean? How did the man that crucified Jesus, those men that crucified Jesus, how did they treat him? Treated him terrible, didn't he? They treated him as if Jesus was an imposter, wasn't he? You're not the son of God. You're not even a king. We're going to mock you. We're going to put a purple robe on you and put a crown of thorns. And they mocked him and they beat him. Right? Paul says if they would have known that he was the Lord of glory, they would never would have done that. But they didn't know. So the man that treated Jesus like that, they mistreated him, put him into a public shame and contempt. A man that goes away from the Lord and falls away from the Lord does the same thing. He aligns himself with the man who treated Jesus that way. Can you imagine the the, the language of this is magnificent. You couldn't describe it any better to say a man who falls away from Christ, who openly rejects Christ, is like a man who now takes the place of the Romans and the Pharisees. 
and shouted, we have no king but Caesar, and, con- and treated Jesus with contempt. What a way to explain it. And like I said, it may be really hard for some of us to accept that and say, well, pastor, this cannot be somebody who has received so much from God. But we're only been reading the text, haven't we? I ain't even brought up one single theologian. Well, I could have, but I won't. Because I don't want to divide anybody into, into a thinking that, oh, this guy says it, oh, I, I got I to sign up with this guy. Oh, this guy says I got to sign up with that guy. No, 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 no. Let's line up with the word of God. What else does it say? He doesn't believe that Jesus is who he claims to be. And the way he lives actually con- causes contempt and shame to the name of Christ. Meaning that people will see his life, see his character, and say, this is a Christian. How is a Christian living like this? And some Christian he is. Some Christ he believes, not able to keep him. Verse 8. But he is like a field that has received the word and the rain. But instead of fruit, there's no longer signs of the word of God having effect in him. All it grows is thorns, thistles. <coughs> or for um, basically nothing good, right? Thorns and thistles is like the curse. Remember chapter 1 of Genesis, chapter 3 of Genesis? Thorns and thistles, you will grow, Adam, because of the curse. He is no longer, look what it says here in verse 8, he's being close to a curse. That's a Hebrewism to say he is no longer useful. He is no longer useful, and he's considered somebody with no salt, no flavor. Uh, Another way of saying it, according to Jesus, is a branch that is no longer attached to him. A branch that's no longer attached to the vine. All it is good for, according to Jesus, is to be burnt alongside the rest. And that's what chapter 8 says. And it ends up being burned, just like what Jesus said. The trouble is that there was growth in this man's life at the beginning. This is where the rubber meets the road, that this man actually received the word of God, received the seed and the rain on both. God didn't discriminate. And that's what they received, the new life. God sent forth his word. And the only difference was the condition of the soil, just like the condition of the clay in the wonderful teaching of Jeremiah chapter 18. The potter wanted to do good, didn't he? He wanted to make the potter a beautiful vessel. What changed? The potter's intention? No. The clay did not want it to be molded. The clay didn't want it. And so the potter made whatever you wanted to be made. You want to be a, a crude pot? You want to be a crude vessel? I'll make you that. Not what I want, but I'll make you that. The sower wants a seed grow, wants to see the seed grow and produce fruit, feed people. Thorns and thistles. Allowing things that choke that seed away. Later on, you find out that in in, in Hebrews, uh, those who have rejected Christ, apostatized, left Christ, completely rejected him, um, are worse off than when they first started. This is the writer of Hebrews. And this is exactly what the writer of Hebrews said happened to the people that came out of Egypt. The people that came out of Egypt were saved by God, sent by God, and oh, did they squander that by turning their hearts hard against God, which is exactly what apostasy is, right? Apostasy is a deliberate, it is a deliberate attempt to go away from Christ. It's deliberate. It doesn't happen. You don't wake out of bed and say, I don't know who I am anymore. It's deliberately, it's purposeful, it's to leave. And those who apostatize says Jesus here, oh, it says the writer of Hebrews, even though they've known the Lord, they now have seen him as evil. They see Christianity as evil, as, as Jesus called to an open shame, right? He calls good evil and evil good. We'll get to that the next time we, we read about it, because we're not talking about, uh, oh, did that go? Oh, yeah, there we go. We're not talking about a backslider. I want to clear that up. I want to clear that up very clear because I want to make sure nobody leaves with this, well, what about me, right? Because we think about things and we think about people, right? You think about ourselves and says, it's not a backslider. From Genesis to Revelation, those who backslide uh, have not completely walked away from the gospel. They simply have failed to live according to what they know. That's a backslider. They have failed to live according to what they know. They know truth. They know right things, but they don't live it. They don't live it. A, there's hope for the backslider, by the way. The Bible says there's hope. God wants them to come back, right? God wants them to come back. They can repent, but an apostate, according to the scripture here, it is impossible, it says. 
There's a lot of church debate whether it is impossible for him or is impossible for God. Now, the writer of Hebrews doesn't get into that debate, thank God. It simply says it is impossible to renew them back to repentance. Why? An apostate has done so much more. He's unwilling. He's rejected Christ. So therefore, he has no connection to salvation anymore. If you reject Christ, there's no, how are you going to be saved now? It's one thing if you know the truth and you fail to live, you could always come back to Christ because you know he's the source of life and the source of eternal life. You could still know that. You just have to just repent. An apostate denies it now, denies that that is the way to be saved. So what hope does he have? None. If he has rejected the only true way of salvation, and he says that's not the way, what hope can he have? The writer of Hebrews is absolutely. It is impossible to renew them to repentance. Why? Because what is good in his heart, he's turned it for evil now. He sees Christ as evil. He sees Christianity as something of a curse of something that is no one should be signed up for it. No one should follow it, right? And so it's an apostate. It's somebody who has not only twisted, but has come against Christ. And denial has turned into a, an, a vilification of Christ. There is a certainly, certainly, this chapter is teaching us that it is possible to begin with Christ. It is possible to begin with Christ and forfeit it according to your own volition and purpose to allow things in your life and to purposely, deliberately not want to grow and leave Christ completely. Now, I know, and next time we talk about this, the theological explanations, because people throughout history, people way smarter than me, have looked at this and said, there has to be a way to explain this, right? And they have come up with all kinds of theories of how to explain it, whether he was or he wasn't or who he is, you know, what happened to him? And I think the better answer is, how did this happen? What led him to the steps? And if I take the whole letter of Hebrews as a, as a letter, because that's why we should take it as a letter, not just a chapter, it's explaining that when you begin to drift and you begin to not follow through on the things that you've known and not to confess the Lord in your life and to leave it up to just, you know, my life, my walk with Christ, or well, whatever, it's a chance, I'll just take my chances, and not growing in Christ into maturity, then there comes a point where sin and other things in your life that you allow will begin to become bigger and bigger, bigger than Christ and bigger than your faith. Oh, pastor, that hasn't happened to me. I'm glad. I'm so happy. Just don't continue in it. Don't continue in it. Because the language here, it is, truly is an amazing letter. The language here in chapter 6, it is somebody who has experienced all of verse 4 and 5. All of it. He's experienced all of it. And it's what Peter said in chapter 2, verse, chapter two 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, that having escaped the pollution of the world through Christ, right, that person goes back to the way they were before, goes back to where they were before. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of salvation than to have done this. It's like a dog returning to his vomit, a pig returning to the mud. I said, your condition is far worse, far more dangerous. In that language, if you think that language is strong, then we haven't really grasped the severity of leaving Christ. You realize that's, that's, that's the key to the matter. Some people get upset about the language. Oh, that sounds so harsh. But you understand what these people are doing. If they are leaving Christ, how severe is that? There's nothing else outside of him. How can you neglect such great salvation, is what the book of Hebrews says. And I love to quote, and you know me, I love to quote the Pilgrim's Progress, right? Uh, if you know me, you're like, Pastor, you bring up every time you teach. I didn't do it last time. I don't think I did it last time, but uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit behind. I got to live up to my reputation. Pilgrim's Progress, get the book, sell your shirt, go grab one, buy one, sell one, whatever it may be, give it to someone. John Bunyan, a Puritan, if you read it. How many have read it? Okay. What did he find at the pearly gates? John Bunyan is so precise in this. What a, God bless him so much. He's an amazing writer. He walked up to the pearly gates, and what did he find? This is a Puritan writer, wonderful teacher. John Bunyan said he saw, he saw a gate, a road that led to hell, even at the pearly gates even after getting all the way to the celestial city, even after getting all the way with Christ, even at the end, at the very end, Bunyan said, you can still choose and turn away from Christ. Why? 
You shouldn't, but he says, it is possible. And see, many men do that. See, many men who held up the word at one time, no longer, no longer. And some encouragement here from the writer of Hebrews, some wonderful encouragement. What is that? The writer of Hebrews is getting our attention. He's letting us know that we have, even though we have committed sin, even though we have committed sin, we have a great high priest. See, he first told us that there's a great high priest before this chapter, didn't he? He knew he was going to get there, but he first needed to encourage us that we need to fear apostasy in our life. But that fear would not paralyze you because you are still invited to come to the throne of grace. You're still invited to come to the throne of grace that leads us to so much more mercy and grace and time would need. And if you fail 10 million times, 10 million times, even in the last hour, you can come for mercy right now. Even if you failed right now, and if you paid no attention to this message for the last hour and you say, well, I don't I just woke up. What in the world's happening? If you fail 10 million times in a day, you can still come to the throne of grace. It doesn't matter what you've done or who you are. You can still come. And the things that I've done need mercy. The things you've done, we need mercy. There's always mercy at the throne of grace. I can't do it on my own, Pastor. I can't live without mercy for an hour. Then stay there. Then park yourself at the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace in time of need, just in time. I need thee every hour, said the songwriter. Oh, I need thee. Oh, Lord, I need thee. And we should change those lyrics to I need thee every minute, every second, right? And the person who is at the feet of Jesus always has nothing to fear. The person who is at the feet of Jesus, talking, relating, exposing himself to God's word, they have nothing to fear and what a security we have in Jesus, right? Run from the city of destruction and get to the cross. We have such a great salvation, such a great high priest, the throne of grace, to find mercy and help in time of need. Severe warning? Yes, it is. Severe threat? Yes, it is. But wonderful, wonderful mercy and grace. And the person who's had that fear and says, well, maybe it's me then come to the throne of grace and you'll find that it wasn't you. An apostate wants nothing to do with Jesus. The backslider knows the truth but fails to live it. It's time to live it. It's time to come back at the throne of Jesus. There's nothing to fear. Come back to him. Don't walk away. Let's pray. Lord, in your mercy and grace, I thank you that we have such a great high priest, such a great and merciful high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the righteous, who sits at the right hand of God. Oh, there's no fear in death. There's no fear in this life. And there's no judgment because of Jesus. There is a judgment for the unbeliever, but there's a judgment that Jesus bore our sins on that cross for every one of us, every person. And Lord, we can make it real to us by grabbing hold of them our great high priest, we thank you, Lord, that you are merciful and there's security in you, there's safety in you, there's assurance in you, there's truth in you. And so, Lord, we remain in you. We want to continually bear fruit for your pleasure. And so I ask for all of my brothers and sisters here that they would, Lord, leave aside those sins that hinder them and leave aside anything that keeps them from growing, that keeps them from having a relationship with you, that keeps them from the throne of grace, and they will once and for all be done with all that and receive not only the mercy and the salvation, but also, Lord, the assurance of resurrection and eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that you have done this. Thank you, Lord, that despite the very real threat and the real warning, we have a throne, a throne of grace. So, Lord, I pray for all those who have been away from Christ for some time to run to him from the city of destruction unto the cross. So grab a hold of it and not leave in this time to never leave. And, Lord, I pray those who have forsaken him for a time that this is their time to make their calling and election sure. 
We praise you, Lord. And we thank you for those who have continued on with Christ, that we will go on and on and on and on with you. Make it real to us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. May this word be like a fresh rain that comes to a soil, a thirsty soil, a thirsty land. And may it produce fruit 30, 60, 100 fold, and that you would be well pleased. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.